9. The Universe Flickers Wan Miao drove along Jingmi Road until he was in the Yin County. From there he headed to Heilongtan, climbed up the mountain along a winding road, and arrived at the Radio Astronomy Observatory of the Chinese Academy of Sciences National Astronomical Center. He saw a line of twenty parabolic antenna dishes, each with a diameter of nine meters, like a row of spectacular steel plants. At the end were two tall radio telescopes with dishes fifty meters in diameter, built in 2006. As he drove closer, Wang could not help but think of the background in the picture of Yi and her daughter. But the work of Sha Ruishin, Ye's student, had nothing to do with these radio telescopes. Dr. Sha's lab was mainly responsible for receiving the data transmitted from three satellites. The Cosmic Background Explorer, COBE, launched in November of 1989 and about to be retired. The Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, launched in 2003, and Planck. The Space Observatory launched by the European Space Agency in 2009. Cosmic microwave background radiation very precisely matched the thermal black body spectrum at a temperature of 2.7255 K and was highly isotropic meaning nearly uniform in every direction with only tiny temperature fluctuations at the parts per million range. Shah Rushin's job was to create a more detailed map of the cosmic microwave background using observational data. The lab wasn't very big. Equipment for receiving satellite data was squeezed into the main computer room, and three terminals displayed the information sent by the three satellites. Shao was excited to see Wang. Clearly bored with his long isolation and happy to have a visitor, he asked Wang what kind of data he wanted to see. I want to see the overall fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background. Can you be more specific? What I mean is, I want to see the isotropic fluctuation in the overall cosmic microwave background, between 1 and 5 percent, he said, quoting from Shin's email. Shah grinned. Starting at the turn of the century, the Miyun Radio Astronomy Observatory had opened itself to visitors. In order to earn some extra income, Shah often played the role of tour guide or gave lectures. This was the grin he reserved for tourists as he had grown used to their astounding scientific illiteracy. Mr. Wang, I take it you're not a specialist in the field? I work in nanotech. Ah, makes sense. But you must have some basic understanding of the cosmic microwave background? I don't know much. I know that as the universe cooled after the Big Bang, the leftover embers became the cosmic microwave background. The radiation fills the entire universe and can be observed in the centimeter wavelength range. I think it was back in the 60s when two Americans accidentally discovered the radiation when they were testing a supersensitive satellite reception antenna. That's more than enough. Cha interrupted, waving his hands. Then you must know that unlike the local variations we observe in different parts of the universe, the overall fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background is correlated with the expansion of the universe. It's a very slow change measured at the scale of the age of the universe. Even with the sensitivity of the Planck satellite, continuous observation for a million years might not detect any such shift. But you want to see a 5% fluctuation tonight? Do you realize what that would mean? The universe would flicker like a fluorescent tube that's about to burn out. And it will be flickering for me, Wan thought. This must be some joke from Professor Yi, Sha said. Nothing would please me more than to discover that it was a joke, Wang said. He was about to tell Sha that Yi didn't know the details of his request, but he was afraid that Sha would then refuse to help him. Well, since Professor Yi asked me to help you, let's do the observation. It's not a big deal. If you just need 1% precision, data from the antique cobe is sufficient. As he spoke, Sha typed quickly at the terminal. Soon a flat green line appeared on the screen. This curve is the real-time measurement of the overall cosmic microwave background though. Calling it a straight line would be more accurate. The temperature is 2.725 plus or minus 0.002 K. 
The error range is due to the Doppler effect from the motion of the Milky Way, which has already been filtered out. If the kind of fluctuation you anticipate in excess of 1% occurs, this line would turn red and become a waveform. I would bet that it's going to stay a flat green line until the end of the world, though. If you want to see it show the kind of fluctuation observable by the naked eye, you might have to wait until long after the death of the sun. I'm not interfering in your work, am I? No. Since you need such low precision, we can just use some basic data from COBE. Okay, it's all set. From now on, if such great fluctuations occur, the data will be automatically saved to disk. I think it might happen around 1 o'clock. Wow, so precise. No problem, since I'm working the night shift, anyway. Have you had dinner yet? Good, then I'll take you on a tour. The night was moonless. They walked along the row of antenna dishes, and Shaw pointed to them. Breathtaking, aren't they? It's too bad that they are all like the ears of a deaf man. Why? Ever since construction was completed, interference has been unceasing in the observational bands. First, there were the paging stations during the 80s. Now, it's the scramble to develop mobile communications networks and cell towers. These telescopes are capable of many scientific tasks surveying the sky, detecting variable radio sources, observing the remains of supernovae but we can't perform most of them. We've complained to the State Regulatory Radio Commission many times, never with any results. How can we get more attention than China Mobile? China Unicom, China Netcom? Without money, the secrets of the universe are worth shit. At least my project only depends on satellite data and has nothing to do with these tourist attractions. In recent years, commercial operation of basic research has been fairly successful, like in high-energy physics. Maybe it would be better if the observatories were built in places farther away from cities? It all comes down to money. Right now, our only choice is to find technical means to shield against interference. Well, it would be much better if Professor Yu were here. She accomplished a lot in this field. So the topic of conversation turned to Yu Wenjie. And from her student, Wang finally learned about her life. He listened as Sha told of how she witnessed the death of her father during the Cultural Revolution, how she was falsely accused at the Production and Construction Corps, how she then seemed to disappear until her return to Beijing at the beginning of the 90s. When she began teaching astrophysics at Tsinghua, where her father had also taught, until her retirement, it was only recently revealed that she had spent more than 20 years at Red Coast Base. Wang was stunned. You mean, those rumors, most turned out to be true. One of the researchers who developed the deciphering system for the Red Coast Project emigrated to Europe and wrote a book last year. Most of the rumors you hear came out of that book. Many who participated in Red Coast are still alive. That is, a fantastical legend. Especially for it to happen during those years absolutely incredible. They continued to speak for a while. Sha asked the purpose behind Wang's strange request. Wang avoided giving a straight answer, and Sha didn't press. The dignity of a specialist did not allow Sha to express too much interest in a request that clearly went against his professional knowledge. Then they went to an all-night bar for tourists and sat for two hours. As Sha finished one beer after another, his tongue loosened even more. But Wang became anxious and his mind kept returning to that green line on the terminal in Shah's office. It was only at ten to one in the morning that Shah finally gave in to Wang's repeated pleas to go back to the lab. The spotlights that had lit up the row of radio antennas had been turned off, and the antennas now formed a simple two-dimensional picture against the night sky like a series of abstract symbols. All of them gazed up at the sky at the same angle, as though waiting expectantly for something. The scene made Wang shudder despite the warmth of the spring evening. He was reminded of the giant pendulums in Three Body. They arrived back at the lab at one. As they looked at the terminal, the fluctuation was just getting started. The flat line turned into a wave, the distance between one peak and the next inconstant. 
the lion's color became red, like a snake awakening after hibernation, wriggling as its skin refilled with blood. It must be a malfunction in Kobe. Shah stared at the waveform, terrified. It's not a malfunction. Wang's tone was exceedingly calm. He had learned to control himself when faced with such sights. We'll know soon enough, Sha said. He went to the other two terminals and typed rapidly to bring up the data gathered by the other two satellites, WMAP and Planck. Now three waveforms moved in sync across the three terminals, exactly alike. Sha took out a notebook computer and rushed to turn it on. He plugged in a network cable and picked up the phone. Wang could tell from the one-sided conversation that he was trying to get in touch with the Urumqi Radio Astronomy Observatory. He didn't explain to Wang what he was doing, his eyes locked onto the browser window on the notebook. Wang could hear his rapid breathing. A few minutes later, a red waveform appeared in the browser window, moving in step with the other three. The three satellites and the ground-based observatory confirmed one fact. The universe was flickering. Can you print out the waveform? Wan asked. Sha wiped away the cold sweat on his forehead and nodded. He moved his mouse and clicked. Print. Wan grabbed the first page as soon as it came out of the laser printer, and with a pencil, began to match the distance between the peaks with the Morse code chart he took out of his pocket. Short long 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 long, short long 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 long, long 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 long, long 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 short short, long 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 short short short, short short long long long, short long 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 long, long 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 short short short, short 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 long long, long long short short short. That's eleven o eight colon twenty one colon thirty seven, one thought. Short long 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 long, short long 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 long, long 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 long, long 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 short short. Long 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 short 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 long 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 short long 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 short 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 long 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 short 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 that's eleven oh eight twenty one thirty six the countdown continued at the scale of the universe ninety two hours had already elapsed and only one thousand one hundred and eight hours remained Sha paced back and forth anxiously pausing from time to time to look at the sequence of numbers Wang was writing down. Can't you tell me what's going on? He shouted. I can't possibly explain this to you, Dr. Sha. Trust me. Wang pushed away the pile of papers filled with waveforms. As he stared at the sequence of numbers, he said, Maybe the three satellites and the observatory are all malfunctioning. You know that's impossible. What if it's sabotage? Also impossible. To simultaneously alter the data from three satellites and an observatory on Earth? You're talking about a supernatural saboteur. Wan nodded. Compared to the idea of the universe flickering, he would prefer a supernatural saboteur. But Sha then deprived him of this last glimmer of hope. It's easy to confirm this. If the cosmic microwave background is fluctuating this much, we should be able to see it with our own eyes. What are you talking about? The wavelength of the cosmic microwave background is 7 centimeters. That's five orders of magnitude longer than the wavelength of visible light. How can we possibly see it? Using 3K glasses. 3K glasses? It's a sort of science toy we made for the Capital Planetarium. With our current level of technology, we could take the six-meter horn antenna used by Penseus and Wilson almost half a century ago to discover the cosmic microwave background and miniaturize it to the size of a pair of glasses. Then we added a converter in the glasses to compress the detected radiation by five orders of magnitude so that seven-centimeter waves are turned into visible red light. This way, visitors can put on the glasses at night and observe the cosmic microwave background on their own. And now, we can use it to see the universe flicker. Where can I find these glasses? At the Capitol Planetarium. We made more than twenty pairs. I must get my hands on a pair before five. Sha picked up the phone. The other side picked up only after a long while. Shah had to expend a lot of energy to convince the person awakened in the middle of the night to go to the planetarium 
and wait for Wang's arrival in an hour. As Wang left, Xia said, I won't go with you. What I've seen is enough, and I don't need any more confirmation. But I hope that you will explain the truth to me when you feel the time is right. If this phenomenon should lead to some research result, I won't forget you. Wang opened the car door and said, The flickering will stop at five in the morning. I'd suggest you not pursue it after this. Believe me, you won't get anywhere. Sha stared at Wang for a long time and then nodded. I understand. Strange things have been happening to scientists lately. Yes. Wang ducked into the car. He didn't want to discuss the subject any further. Is it our turn? It's my turn, at least. Wang started the engine. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. An hour later, Wang arrived at the new planetarium and got out of the car. The bright lights of the city penetrated the translucent walls of the immense glass building and dimly revealed its internal structure. One thought that if the architect had intended to express a feeling about the universe, the design was a success. The more transparent something was, the more mysterious it seemed. The universe itself was transparent, as long as you were. Sufficiently sharp-eyed, you could see as far as you liked. But the farther you looked, the more mysterious it became. The sleepy-eyed planetarium staffer was waiting by the door for one. He handed him a small suitcase and said, There are five pairs of 3K glasses in here, all fully charged. The left button switches it on. The right dial is for adjusting brightness. I have a dozen more pairs upstairs. You can look as much as you like but I'm going to take a nap now in the room over there. This Dr. Shah must be mental. He went into the dim interior of the planetarium. One opened the suitcase on the back seat of his car and took out a pair of 3K glasses. It resembled the display inside the panoramic viewing helmet of the V-suit. He put the glasses on and looked around. The city looked the same as before, only dimmer. Then he remembered that he had to switch them on. The city turned into many hazy glowing halos. Most were fixed, but a few flickered or moved. He realized that these were sources of radiation in the centimeter range, all now converted to visible light. At the heart of each halo was a radiation source. Because the original wavelengths were so long, it was impossible to see their shapes clearly. He lifted his head and saw a sky glowing with a faint red light. Just like that, he was seeing the cosmic microwave background. The red light had come from more than 10 billion years ago. It was the remnants of the Big Bang, the still warm embers of creation. He could not see any stars. Normally, since visible light would be compressed to invisible by the glasses, each star should appear as a black dot. But the diffraction of centimeter wave radiation overwhelmed all other shapes and details. Once his eyes had grown used to the sight, Wang could see that the faint red background was indeed pulsing. The entire sky flickered, as if the universe was but a quivering lamp in the wind. Standing under the flashing dome of the night sky, Wang suddenly felt the universe shrink until it was so small that only he was imprisoned in it. The universe was a cramped heart, and the red light that suffused everything was the translucent blood that filled the organ. Suspended in the blood, he saw that the flickering of the red light was not periodic the pulsing was irregular. He felt a strange, perverse, immense presence that could never be understood by human intellect. One took off the 3K glasses and sat down weakly on the ground, leaning against the wheel of his car. The city at night gradually recovered the reality of visible light. But his eyes roamed, trying to capture other sights. By the entrance of the zoo across the street, there was a row of neon lights. One of the lights was about to burn out and flickered irregularly. Nearby, a small tree's leaves trembled in the night breeze, twinkling without pattern as they reflected streetlight. In the distance, the red star atop the Beijing Exhibition Center's Russian-style spire reflected the light from the cars passing below, also twinkling randomly. Wang tried to interpret the flickers as Morse code. 
He even felt that the wrinkles in the flags flapping next to him and the ripples in the puddle on the side of the road might be sending him messages. He struggled to understand all the messages, and felt the passing of the countdown, second by second. He didn't know how long he stayed there. The planetarium staffer finally emerged and asked him whether he was done. But when he saw Wang's face, sleep disappeared from the staffer's eyes and was replaced by fear. He packed up the 3K glasses, stared at Wang for a few seconds, and quickly left with the suitcase. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Wang took out his mobile and dialed Xin Yufei's number. She picked up right away. Perhaps she was also suffering from insomnia. What happens at the end of the countdown? Wang asked. I don't know. She hung up. What can it be? Maybe my own death, like Yang Dong's. Or maybe it will be a disaster like the great tsunami that swept through the Indian Ocean more than a decade ago. No one will connect it to my nanotech research. Could it be that every previous great disaster, including the two world wars, was also the result of reaching the end of ghostly countdowns? Could it be that every time there was someone like me, who no one thought of, who bore the ultimate responsibility? Or maybe it signals the end of the whole world. In this perverse world, that would be a relief. One thing was certain. No matter what was at the end of the countdown, in the remaining 1,000 or so hours, the possibilities would torture him cruelly, like demons, until he suffered a complete mental breakdown. Wang ducked back into the car and left the planetarium. Just before dawn, the roads were relatively empty. But he didn't dare to drive too fast, feeling that the faster the car moved, the faster the countdown would go. When a glimmer of light appeared in the eastern sky, he parked and walked around aimlessly. His mind was empty of thoughts. Only the countdown pulsed against the dim red background of cosmic radiation. He seemed to have turned into nothing but a simple timer, a bell that told for he knew not whom. The sky brightened. He was tired, so he sat down on a bench. When he lifted his head to see where his subconscious had brought him, he shivered. He sat in front of St. Joseph's Church at Wangfujing. In the pale white light of dawn, the church's Romanesque vaults appeared as three giant fingers pointing out something in space for him. As Wang got up to leave, he was held back by a snippet of hymnal music. It wasn't Sunday, so it was likely a choir rehearsal. The song was, Come, Gracious Spirit, Heavenly Dove. As he listened to the solemn, sacred music, Wang Miao once again felt that the universe had shrunk until it was the size of an empty church. The domed ceiling was hidden by the flashing red light of the background radiation and he was an ant crawling through the cracks in the floor. He felt a giant, invisible hand caressing his trembling heart, and he was once again a helpless babe. Something deep in his mind that had once held him up softened like wax and collapsed. He covered his eyes and began to cry. Wang's cries were interrupted by laughter. Ha ha, another one bites the dust. He turned around. Captain Shurchang stood there, blowing out a mouthful of white smoke. 10. De Shur. Shur sat down next to Wang and handed him his car keys. You parked right at the intersection at Dongnan. If I had arrived just a minute later, the traffic cops would have had it towed. De Shur, if I had known you were following me, I would have been comforted, Wang thought, switching to Shur Chang's familiar nickname in his mind, though self-respect made him hold back the words. He accepted a cigarette from Desher, lit it, and took his first drag since he quit several years ago. So how's it going, buddy? Finding it hard to bear? I said you couldn't handle it. And you insisted on playing the tough guy. You wouldn't understand. Wang took several more deep puffs. Your problem is, you understand too well. Fine, let's go grab a bite. I'm not hungry. Then we'll go drinking. My treat. Wang got into Desher's car and they drove to a small restaurant nearby. It was still early, and the place was deserted. Two orders of quick fried tripe, and a bottle of Urguitu. Desher shouted, without even looking up. 
He was obviously a regular here. As he stared at the two plates filled with black slices of tripe, Wang's empty stomach began to churn, and he thought he was going to be sick. Dishur ordered him some warm soy milk and fried pancakes, and Wang forced himself to eat some. Then they drank shots of agua too. He began to feel lightheaded, and his tongue loosened. Gradually, he recounted the events of the last three days to Dishur. Even though he knew that Dishur probably knew everything already, maybe Dishur even knew more than he did. You're saying that the universe was winking at you? Dishur asked, as he slurped down strips of tripe like noodles. That's a very appropriate metaphor. Bullshit. Your lack of fear is based on your ignorance. More bullshit. Come drink. Wang finished another shot. Now the world was spinning around him, and only the tripe chomping Shi Chang across from him remained stable. He said, Dishur, have you ever considered certain ultimate philosophical questions? For example, where does man come from? Where does man go? Where does the universe come from? Where does the universe go? Etc. Nope. Never? Never. You must see the stars. Aren't you odd and curious? I never look at the sky at night. How is that possible? I thought you often work the night shift. Buddy, when I work at night, if I look up at the sky, the suspect is going to escape. We really have nothing to say to each other. All right. Drink. To be honest, even if I were to look at the stars in the sky, I wouldn't be thinking about your philosophical questions. I have too much to worry about. I gotta pay the mortgage, save for the kids' college, and handle the endless stream of cases. I'm a simple man without a lot of complicated twists and turns. Look down my throat, and you can see out my ass. Naturally, I don't know how to make my bosses like me. Years after being discharged from the army, my career is going nowhere. If I weren't pretty good at my job, I would have been kicked out a long time ago. You think that's not enough for me to worry about? You think I've got the energy to gaze at stars and philosophize? You're right. All right, drink up. But I did indeed invent an ultimate rule. Tell me. Anything sufficiently weird must be fishy. What? What kind of crappy rule is that? I'm saying that there's always someone behind things that don't seem to have an explanation. If you had even basic knowledge of science, you'd know it's impossible for any force to accomplish the things I experienced. Especially that last one. To manipulate things at the scale of the universe not only can you not explain it with our current science, I couldn't even imagine how to explain it outside of science. It's more than supernatural. It's super I don't know what. I'm telling you, that's bullshit. I've seen plenty of weird things. Then tell me what I should do next. Keep on drinking. And then sleep. Fine. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Wang Miao had no idea how he got back into his car. He tumbled into the back seat and fell into a dreamless slumber. He didn't think that he was asleep for long, but when he opened his eyes, the sun was already near the horizon in the west. He got out of the car. Even though the alcohol that morning had made him weak, he did feel better. He saw that he was at one corner of the forbidden city. The setting sun shone on the ancient palace and turned into bright gold ripples in the moat. In his eyes, the world became once again classical and stable. One sat until it got dark, enjoying the peace that had been missing from his life. The black Volkswagen Santana that he was now so familiar with pulled out of the traffic streaming through the street and braked to a stop right in front of him. Shir Chang got out of the car. Slept well? Dishir growled. Yes. What next? Who? You. Go have dinner. Then drink a little more. Then sleep again. Then what? Then? Don't you have to go to work tomorrow? But the countdown. There's only 1,091 hours left. Fuck the countdown. Your first priority right now is to make sure you can stand straight and not collapse into a heap. 
Then we can talk about other things. Dis sure, can you tell me something about what's really going on? I'm begging you. Dis sure stared at Wang a while. Then he laughed. I've said the very same thing to General Chan several times. We're in the same boat, you and I. I'll be honest, I know fucking shit. My pay grade is too low, and they tell me nothing. Sometimes I think this is a nightmare. But you must know more than I. Fine. I'll tell you what little I know. Deshur pointed to the shore of the moat around the Forbidden City. The two found a spot and sat down. It was now night, and traffic flowed ceaselessly behind them like a river. They watched their shadows lengthening and shortening over the moat. In my line of work, it's all about putting together many apparently unconnected things. When you piece them together the right way, you get the truth. For a while now, strange things have been happening. For example, there's been an unprecedented wave of crimes against academia and science research institutions. Of course you know about the explosion at the Liangxiang Accelerator construction site. There was also the murder of that Nobel laureate. The crimes were all unusual, not for money, not for revenge. No political background, just pure destruction. Other strange things didn't involve crimes. For example, the frontiers of science and the suicides of those academics. Environmental activists have also become extra bold, protest mobs at construction sites to stop nuclear power plants and hydroelectric dams, experimental communities returning to nature, and other apparently trivial matters. Do you go to the movies? No, not really. Recent big-budget films all have rustic themes. The setting is always green mountains and clear water, with handsome men and pretty women of some indeterminate era living in harmony with nature. To use the words of the directors, they represent the beautiful life before science spoiled. Nature. Take Peach Blossom Spring. It's clearly the sort of film that no one wants to see. But they spent hundreds of millions to make it. There was also the science fiction contest with a top reward of five million for the person who imagined the most disgusting possible future. They spent another few hundred million to turn the winning stories into movies. And then you've got all these strange cults popping up everywhere, where every cult leader seems to have a lot of money. What does that last bit have to do with everything you mentioned before? You have to connect all the dots. Of course I didn't need to busy myself with such concerns before, but after I was transferred from the crime unit to the battle command center, it became part of my job. Even General Chang is impressed by my talent for connecting the dots. And your conclusion? Everything that's happening is coordinated by someone behind the scenes with one goal, to completely ruin scientific research. Who? I have no idea. But I can sense the plan, a very comprehensive, intricate plan, damage scientific research installations, kill scientists, drive scientists like you crazy and make you commit suicide but the main goal is to misdirect your thoughts until you're even more foolish than ordinary people. Your last statement is really perceptive. At the same time, they want to ruin science's reputation in society. Of course some people have always engaged in anti-science activities, but now it's coordinated. I believe it. Now you believe me. So many of you scientific elites couldn't figure it out, and I, having gone only to vocational school, had the answer? Ha! Huh. After I explained my theory, the scholars and my bosses all ridiculed it. If you had told me your theory back then, I'm sure I wouldn't have laughed at you. Take those frauds who practice pseudoscience do you know who they're most afraid of? Scientists, of course. No. Many of the best scientists can be fooled by pseudoscience and sometimes devote their lives to it. But pseudoscience is afraid of one. Particular type of people who are very hard to fool, stage magicians. In fact, many pseudoscientific hoaxes were exposed by stage magicians. Compared to the bookworms of the scientific world, your experience as a cop makes you far more likely to perceive such a large-scale conspiracy. Well, there are plenty of people smarter than me. 
People in positions of power are well aware of the plot. When they ridiculed me at first, it was only because I wasn't explaining my theory to the right people. Later on, my old company commander General Chang had me transferred. But I'm still not doing anything other than running errands. That's it. Now you know as much as I do. Another question, what does this have to do with the military? I was baffled too. I asked them, and they said that now that there's a war, of course the military would be involved. I was like you, thinking that they were talking nonsense. But no, they weren't joking. The army really is on high alert. There are twenty-some battle command centers like ours around the globe. And above them there's another level of command structure. But no one knows the details. Who's the enemy? No idea. NATO officers are now stationed in the war room of the PLA General Staff Department, and a bunch of PLA officers are working out of the Pentagon. Who the fuck knows who we're fighting? This is all so bizarre. Are you sure it's all true? A bunch of my old buddies from the army are now generals, so I know a few things. The media has no idea about any of this. Ah, that's another thing. All the countries are keeping a tight lid on this, and they've been successful so far. I can guarantee you that the enemy is incredibly powerful. Those in charge are terrified. I know General Chang very well. He's the sort who's afraid of nothing, not even the sky falling, but I can tell that he's worried about something much worse right now. They're all scared out of their wits, and they have no confidence that we'll win. If what you say is true, then we should all be frightened. Everyone is afraid of something. The enemy must be, too. The more powerful they are, the more they have to lose to their fears. What do you think the enemy is afraid of? You. Scientists. The odd thing is that the less practical your research is, the more they're afraid of you like abstract theories, the kind of thing Yang Dong worked on. They are more frightened of such work than you are of the universe winking at you. That's why they're so ruthless. If killing you would solve the problem, you'd all be dead by now. But the most effective technique remains disrupting your thoughts. When a scientist dies, another will take his place. But if his thoughts are confused, then science is over. You're saying they're afraid of fundamental science? Yes, fundamental science. But my research is very different in nature from Yang Dong's. The nanomaterial I work on isn't fundamental science. It's just a very strong material. What's the threat to them? You're a special case. Usually, they don't bother those engaged in applied research. Maybe the material you're developing really scares them. Then what should I do? Go to work and keep up your research. That's the best way to strike back at them. Don't worry about that shitty countdown. If you want to relax a bit after work, play that game. If you can beat it, that might help. That game? Three body? You think it's connected to all this? Definitely connected. I know that several specialists at the Battle Command Center are playing it, too. It's no ordinary game. Someone like me, fearless out of ignorance, can't play it. It has to be someone knowledgeable like you. Anything else? No. But if I find out more, I'll let you know. Keep your phone on, buddy. Keep your head screwed on straight, and if you get scared again, just remember my ultimate rule. Dishur drove away before Wan had a chance to thank him. 11. Three Body, Mosey and Fiery Flames Wang Miao returned home, stopping on the way to buy a V-suit. His wife told him that people from work had been trying to get a hold of him all day. Wang turned on his phone, checked his messages, and returned a few calls. He promised he'd be at work tomorrow. At dinner, he followed Deshur's advice and drank some more. But he didn't feel sleepy. After his wife went to bed, he sat in front of the computer, put on his new V-suit, and logged into three-body. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Desolate plain at dawn. One stood in front of King Zhou's pyramid. The snow that had once covered it was gone, and the blocks of stone were pockmarked by erosion. The ground was now a different color. 
In the distance were a few massive buildings that one guessed were dehydratories, but they were of a different design than the ones he had seen last time. Everything told him that eons had passed. By the faint dawn light, Juan looked for the entrance. When he found it, he saw that the opening had been sealed by blocks of stone. But next to it, there was now a staircase carved into the pyramid leading all the way to the apex. He looked up and saw that the top had been flattened into a platform. The pyramid, once Egyptian in style, now resembled an Aztec one. Wang climbed up the stairs and reached the apex. The platform looked like an ancient astronomical observatory. In one corner was a telescope several meters high, and next to it were a few smaller telescopes. In another corner were a few strange instruments that reminded him of ancient Chinese armillary spheres, models of objects in the sky. His attention was drawn to the large copper sphere in the center of the platform. Two meters in diameter, it was set on top of a complex machine. Propelled by countless gears, the sphere slowly rotated. Juan noticed that the direction and speed of its rotation constantly shifted. Below the machine was a large square cavity. By the faint torchlight within, Juan saw a few slave-like figures pushing a spoked, horizontal wheel, which provided the power to the machine above. A man walked toward Juan. Like King Wen when Wang had first encountered him, the man had his back against a sliver of light on the horizon, and he appeared to Wang as a pair of bright eyes floating in the darkness. He was slender and tall, dressed in a flowing black robe, his hair carelessly knotted on top of his head with a few strands waving in the wind. Hello, the man said. I'm Mosey. Hello, I'm Hiran. Ah, uh, I know you. Mosey grew excited. You were a follower of King Wen back in Civilization Number 137. I did follow him here. But I never believed his theories. You're right. Mozi nodded at Wang solemnly. Then he moved closer. During the 362,000 years you've been away, civilization has been reborn four more times. These civilizations struggled to develop through the irregular alternation of chaotic eras and stable eras. The shortest lived one got only halfway through the Stone Age, but civilization number 139 broke a record and developed all the way to the Steam Age. You're saying that people from that civilization found the laws governing the sun's motion? Mosey laughed and shook his head. Not at all. They were just lucky. But the effort to do so has never ceased? Of course not. Come, let us see the efforts of the last civilization. Mosey led Wang to a corner of the observatory platform. The ground spread. Out beneath them like an ancient piece of leather. Mosey aimed one of the smaller telescopes at a target on the ground and gestured for Wang to look. Wang looked through the eyepiece and saw a strange sight, a skeleton. In the dawn light it gave off a snow-white glint and appeared to be very refined. Astonishingly, the skeleton stood on its own. Its posture was graceful and elegant. One hand was held below the chin, as though stroking a long missing beard. Its head tilted slightly up, as though questioning sky and earth. That's Confucius, Mosey said. He believed that everything had to fit Li, the Confucian conception of order and propriety, and nothing in the universe could be exempt from it. He created a system of rights and hoped to predict the motion of the sun with it. I can imagine the result. Right you are. He calculated how the sun would follow the rites, and predicted a five-year stable era. And you know what? There was indeed a stable era. Lasting a month. And then one day the sun just didn't come out. No, the sun rose that day as well. It rose to the middle of the sky, and then went out. What? Went out? Yes. It gradually dimmed, became smaller, and then went out all of a sudden. Night fell. Oh, the cold. Confucius stood there and froze into a column of ice. And there he remains. Was there anything remaining in the sky after the sun went out? A flying star appeared in that location, like a soul left behind after the sun died. You're sure that the sun really disappeared suddenly, 
and the flying star appeared just as suddenly? Yes, absolutely. You can check the historical annals. It was clearly recorded. Hmm. One thought hard about this information. He had already formed some vague ideas about the workings of the world of three body. But this bit of news from Mosey overturned all his theories. How can it be? Sudden? He muttered in annoyance. We're now in the Han Dynasty. I'm not sure if it's the Western Han or the Eastern Han. You've stayed alive until now? I have a mission, observing the precise movements of the sun. Those shamans, metaphysicians, and Taoists are all useless. Like those proverbial bookish men who could not even tell types of grains apart, they do not labor with their hands, and know nothing practical. They have no ability to do experiments, and they're immersed in their mysticism all day long. But I'm different. I know how to make things. He pointed to the numerous instruments on the platform. Do you think these can lead you to your goal? One nodded specifically at the giant copper sphere. I have theories, too, but they're not mystical. They're derived from a large number of observations. First, do you know what the universe is? It's a machine. That's not very insightful. Let me be more specific. The universe is a hollow sphere floating in the middle of a sea of fire. There are numerous tiny holes in the surface of the sphere, as well as a large one. The light from the sea of flames shines through these holes. The tiny ones are stars, and the large one is the sun. That's a very interesting model. Juan looked at the giant copper sphere again and guessed at its purpose. But there's a problem with your theory. When the sun rises or sets, we can see its motion against the background of fixed stars. But in your hollow sphere, all the holes remain in fixed positions relative to each other. Correct. That's why I've modified my model. The universal sphere is made of two spheres, one inside the other. The sky we can see is the surface of the inner sphere. The outer sphere has one large hole, while the inner sphere has many small holes. The light coming through the hole in the outer sphere is reflected and scattered many times in the space between the two spheres, filling it with light. Then the light comes in through the tiny holes in the inner sphere, and that's how we see the stars. What about the sun? The sun is the result of the large hole in the outer sphere being projected onto the inner one. The projection is so bright that it penetrates the inner sphere like the shell of an egg, and that is how we see the sun. Around the spot of light, the scattered light rays are also very bright, and can be seen through the inner shell. That is why we can see a clear sky during the day. What is the force that propels the two spheres in their irregular motion? It's the force of the sea of fire outside the two spheres. But the sun's brightness and size change over time. In your double shell model, the sun's size and brightness ought to be fixed. Even if the brightness of the flames in the sea of fire is inconstant, the size of the hole would not be. Your conception of this model is too simplistic. As conditions in the sea of fire shift and change, the two shells will expand and shrink. This leads to changes in the size and brightness of the sun. What about the flying stars? Flying stars? Why do you care about them? They're not important. Maybe just some random dust flying about the inside of the universal spheres. No, I think the flying stars are extremely important. Otherwise, how does your model explain the sudden extinguishing of the sun during the time of Confucius? That's a rare exception. Maybe it was because a dark spot or cloud in the sea of fire just happened to pass over the big hole in the outer shell. Juan pointed to the large copper sphere. This must be your model then? Yes. I built a machine to replicate the universe. The complex gears that move the sphere simulate the forces from the sea of fire. The laws governing such motion are based on the distribution of flames in the sea of fire and the currents within it. I deduce them from hundreds of years of observations. Can this sphere contract and expand? Of course. Right now it's slowly contracting. One used the handrail at the edge of the platform as a fixed visual reference. He found Mosey's assertion to be true. 
And there's an inner shell inside this sphere? Of course. The inner shell moves within the outer shell through another complex set of mechanisms. Truly a skillfully designed machine. Wang's praise was heartfelt. But I don't see a large hole in the outer shell to cast the sun's light onto the inner shell. There is no hole. On the inner surface of the outer shell I have installed a source of light to simulate the hole. The light source is made of the luminescent material gathered from hundreds of thousands of fireflies. I use the cool light because the inner shell is made of translucent plaster, which is not a good heat conductor. This way, I can avoid the problem of too much heat accumulating inside the sphere that we would have with a regular source of light. The observer can then stay inside for a long time. There's a person inside the sphere? Yes. A clerk stands on top of a shelf with a wheeled base that is kept at the center of the sphere. After we set up the model universe to correspond to the current state of the real universe, the motion of the model thereafter should be an accurate simulation of the future, including the motion of the sun. After the clerk records the movements of the sun, we will have a precise calendar. This is the dream of hundreds of civilizations before us. And it looks like you have come at an opportune time. According to the model universe, a four-year-long stable era is about to begin. Emperor Wu of Han has just issued the order to rehydrate based on my prediction. Let's wait for sunrise. Mosey brought up the game's interface and slightly increased the rate of passage of game time. A red sun rose above the horizon, and the numerous frozen lakes and ponds scattered over the plain began to melt. These lakes had been covered by dust and had merged into the dun ground, but now they turned into numerous mirrors, as though the earth had opened many eyes. From up so high, Wang couldn't see the details of rehydration, but he could see more and more people gathered on the shores of the lakes like swarms of ants coming out of their nests in spring. The world had once again been revived. Do you not want to join this wonderful life? Mosey asked pointing to the ground below. When women are first revived, they crave love. There is no reason for you to stay here any longer. The game is over. I am the winner. As a piece of machinery, your model universe is indeed incomparable. But as for its predictions, may I use your telescope to observe? Something? Please. Mosey gestured at the large telescope. Wang walked up to the instrument and paused. How can I use it to observe the sun? Mosey retrieved a black, circular piece of glass. Use this smoked glass filter. He inserted it in front of the eyepiece. Wang aimed the telescope at the sun, now halfway up the sky. He was impressed by Mosey's imagination. The sun did indeed look like a hole through which a sea of fire could be seen, a small view into a much larger hole. But as he examined the image in the telescope more closely, he realized that the sun was different from the sun he was used to in real life. The sun here had a small core. He imagined the sun as an eye. The core was like the eye's pupil, and though it was small, it was bright and dense. The layers surrounding it, by contrast, appeared insubstantial, wispy, gaseous. The fact that he could see through the outside layers to the core indicated that those layers were transparent or translucent, and the light from those layers was likely just scattered light from the core. The details in the image of the sun stunned Wang. He was once again assured that the game designers had hidden a vast amount of data within the superficially simple images, just waiting to be revealed by players. As Wang pondered the meaning of the sun's structure, he became excited. Because time in the game was now passing quickly, the sun was already in the west. Wang stood, adjusted the telescope to aim at the sun again, and tracked it until it dipped below the horizon. Night fell, and the bonfires across the plains mirrored the sky full of stars. Wang took off the smoked glass filter and continued to scan the skies. He was most interested in the flying stars, and shortly found two. He only had time to observe one of them briefly before it was dawn again. So he inserted the filter and continued to observe the sun. In this manner Wang performed astronomical observations for more than ten days, 
enjoying the thrill of discovery. Indeed, the fact that time within the game had been sped up helped with the observations, as the motion of celestial bodies became more apparent. On the seventeenth day of the stable era, five hours after the predicted time for sunrise, the world was still under cover of dark night. Multitudes thronged at the foot of the pyramid, their innumerable torches flickering in the chill wind. The sun will probably not rise again. It is like at the end of civilization number 137, Bong said to Mosey. Mosey stroked his beard and smiled confidently. Do not fret. The sun will rise soon, and the stable era will continue. I've already learned the secret of the motion of the universal machine. My predictions cannot be wrong. As though confirming Mosey's words, the sky over the horizon brightened with dawn's first light. The crowd around the pyramid shouted in joy. The silvery light brightened far more rapidly than usual, as though the rising sun wanted to make up for lost time. Soon, the light covered half the sky, even though the sun was still below the horizon. The world was already as bright as midday. One looked toward the horizon and saw it giving off a blinding glare. The glowing horizon arched upward and became a curve that spread from one edge of his visual field to the other. He soon realized that he wasn't seeing the horizon, but the edge of the rising sun, an incomparably immense sun. After his eyes adjusted to the bright light, the horizon reappeared in its old place. Wang saw columns of black smoke rising in the distance, especially clear against the glowing background of the solar disk. A fast horse rushed toward the pyramid from the direction of the rising sun, the dust from its hooves forming a distinct line across the plains. The crowd parted before the horse, and Wang heard the rider scream at the top of his lungs. Dehydrate! Dehydrate! Following the rider was a herd of cattle, horses, and other animals. Their bodies were on fire, and they moved across the ground like a burning carpet. Half of the gigantic sun's disk was now above the horizon, taking up much of the sky. The earth seemed to slowly sink down against a brilliant wall. Wang could clearly make out the fine structures on the surface of the sun, eddies and surging waves filling the sea of flames, sunspots floating along random paths like ghosts, the corona lazily spreading out like golden sleeves. On the ground, both those who had already dehydrated and those who hadn't began to burn like countless logs thrown into the belly of a furnace. The flames that consumed them were even brighter than glowing charcoal in a furnace, but were quickly extinguished. The giant sun continued to rise and soon filled most of the sky. Juan looked up and felt his perspective shift. Suddenly he was no longer looking up, but down. The surface of the giant sun became a fiery earth, and he felt himself falling toward this brilliant hell. Lakes and ponds began to evaporate, and puffs of white steam rose up like mushroom clouds. They rose, spilled open, and dispersed, covering the ashes of the dead. The stable era will continue. The universe is a machine. I created this machine. The stable era will continue. The universe. Wang turned his head. The voice belonged to Mosey, who was already on fire. His body was encased within a column of tall, orange flame, and his skin crinkled and turned into charcoal. But his two eyes still shone with a light that was distinct from the fire consuming him. His two hands, already burning pieces of charcoal, held up the cloud of swirling ashes that had once been his calendar. Wang was burning up as well. He lifted his two hands and saw two torches. The sun briskly moved to the west, revealing the sky behind it. It soon fell below the horizon, and the ground seemed to rise against the brilliant wall this time. A dazzling sunset swiftly turned to night, as though a pair of giant hands had pulled a black cloth over a world that had turned to ash. The earth glowed with a dim red light like a piece of charcoal just retrieved from a furnace. For a brief moment, Wang saw the stars, but soon steam and smoke hid the sky and covered everything on the red glowing earth. The world sank into a dark chaos. A red line of text appeared. 
Civilization No. 141 fell into ruin in flames. This civilization had advanced to the Eastern Han period. The seed of civilization remains. It will germinate and again progress through the unpredictable world of three body. We invite you to log on in the future. Wang took off the V-suit. After his mind had calmed down a bit, he again had the thought that three body was deliberately pretending to be merely illusory, while in fact possessing some deep reality. The real world in front of him, on the other hand, had begun to seem like the superficially complex, but in truth rather simple, along the river during the Qingming festival. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The next day, Wang went to the Nanotechnology Research Center. Other than some minor confusion due to his absence the day before, everything was normal. He found work to be an effective tranquilizer. As long as he was absorbed by it, he was no longer bothered by his nightmarish worries. He deliberately kept himself constantly busy the whole day and left the lab only after it was dark. As soon as Wang left the research center building, the nightmare-like feeling caught up to him. He felt like the starry sky was a magnifying glass that covered the world, and he was a tiny insect below the lens with nowhere to hide. He had to find something to occupy himself. Then he thought of Yang Dong's mother Yu Wenjie and drove to her home. Yu was alone at home. When Wang entered, she was sitting on the sofa reading. Wang noticed that her eyes were both myopic and presbyopic, and she had to switch glasses both when she read and when she looked at something far away. She was very happy to see Wang, and said that he looked much better than the last time he had come to see her. Wang chuckled. It's all because of your ginseng. You shook her head. What I gave you wasn't very good. We used to be able to find really high-quality wild ginseng around the base. I once found one about this long. I wonder what it's like there now. I heard that it's deserted. Well, I guess I'm really getting old. These days, I'm always thinking about the past. I heard that you suffered a lot during the Cultural Revolution. You heard it from Russian, didn't you? You waved her hand, as though trying to wave away a strand of spider silk. In the past, it's all in the past. Last night, Russian called me. He was in such a hurry that I had a hard time understanding him. All I got was that something seemed to have happened to you. Xiao Wang, let me tell you, by the time you're my age, you'll realize that everything you once thought mattered so much turns out to mean very little. Thank you, Wang said. He once again felt the warmth that he had missed. In his current state, his mental stability depended on two pillars, this old woman who had weathered so many storms and become as gentle as water, and Shir Chan, the man who feared nothing because he knew nothing. He continued. As far as the Cultural Revolution is concerned, I was pretty lucky. Just when I thought I had nowhere to go, I found a place where I could survive. You mean Red Coast Base? He nodded. That was truly an incredible project. I used to think it was just made-up rumors. Not rumors. If you want, I can tell you some of what I experienced. The offer made Wang a little worried. Professor Yi, I'm only curious. You don't need to tell me if it's not appropriate. It's no big deal. Let's just imagine that I'm looking for someone to hear me talk. You could go visit the senior center. You wouldn't be lonely if you went there occasionally. Many of those retirees were my colleagues back at the university but somehow I just can't mix with them. Everyone likes to reminisce, but no one wants to listen, and everyone feels annoyed when someone else tells a story. You're the only one who's interested in Red Coast. But for you to tell me about those things, isn't that prohibited? That's true, it's still classified. But after that book was published, many others who were there also began to tell their stories, so they're like open secrets. The person who wrote that book was very irresponsible. Even if we put aside his agenda, the content of that book was often inaccurate. I should at least correct those errors. Then Yi Wenjia began to tell Wang about what happened to her during her years at Red Coast. 12. 
Red Coast 2. He wasn't given a real job immediately after entering Red Coast Base. Under the watchful eyes of a security guard, she was only allowed to perform a few technical tasks. Back when she was still a second year in college, he had already known the professor who would end up being her thesis advisor. He had told you that to do astrophysics research, it was useless to excel at theory without knowledge of experimental methods and observational skills at least. That was true in China. This was very different from her father's view, but Yi tended to agree with her professor. She had always felt that her father was too theoretical. Her advisor was one of the pioneers of Chinese radio astronomy. Under his influence, Yi developed a great interest in radio astronomy as well. Thus, she taught herself electrical engineering and computer science, the foundation for experiments and observations in the field. During the two years when she was a graduate student, the two of them had tested China's first small-scale radio telescope and had accumulated a great deal of experience in the area. She hadn't expected the knowledge would one day be useful at Red Coast Base. Eventually, Yu was assigned to the transmission department to maintain and repair equipment. She quickly became an indispensable part of their operations. Initially, this confused her a bit. She was the only person at the base who wasn't in a military uniform. And given her political status, everyone kept their distance. She had no way to ward off the loneliness other than devoting herself to work. However, this wasn't enough to explain why they relied on her so much. This was, after all, a key defense project. How could the technical staff here be so mediocre that she who had not majored in engineering and who had no real working experience, easily took over their jobs. She learned the reason soon enough. Contrary to appearances, the base's staff was composed of the best technical officers from the 2nd Artillery Corps. She could study all her life and have no hope of catching up to those excellent electrical and computer engineers. But the base was remote, the conditions were poor, and the main research work of the Red Coast project was already completed. All that was left was maintenance and operation, so there was little opportunity for achieving any interesting technical results. Most people did not want to be indispensable, because they understood that in highly classified projects like this, once someone was put into a core technical position, it would be very difficult for him to be transferred out. Thus, all of them tried to deliberately hide their technical competence as they went about their jobs. Yet, they couldn't appear too incompetent. So if the supervisor said to go east, they would work hard to move west, purposely playing the fool. Their hope was to put the following thought into the supervisor's head. This man is working hard, but he's limited in his skills. There's no point in keeping him, because he'll only get in the way. Many really did successfully obtain transfers through this method. Under such conditions, he gradually became a key technician at the base. But the other reason that she could achieve this position puzzled her, and for that she could find no explanation. Red Coast Base at least the parts that she had contact with had no real advanced technology at all. Over time, as he continued to work at the transmission department, the restrictions on her were gradually relaxed and even the security guard assigned to watch her was called off. She was allowed to touch most components of Red Coast systems and could read the relevant technical documents. Of course, there were still areas forbidden to her. For example, she wasn't allowed near the computer control systems. However, Yi discovered that the impact of those systems on Red Coast was far smaller than she had imagined. For instance, the transmission department's computers consisted of three machines even more primitive than DJS-130. They used cumbersome magnetic core memory and paper input tape, and their longest uptime did not exceed 15 hours. She also saw that the precision of Red Coast's targeting system was very low, probably not even on par with that of an artillery cannon. One day, Commissar Lei came to speak with Yi. By this time, Yang Weining and Lei Jiqing had swapped places in her eyes. During those years, Yang, 
as the highest ranked technical officer, did not enjoy a high political status, and outside of technical matters he had little authority. He had to be careful with his subordinates, and had to speak politely even to the sentries, lest he be deemed to have an intellectual's resistant attitude toward thought reform and collaboration with the masses. Thus, whenever he encountered difficulties in his work, ye became his punching bag. But as ye gained importance as a technical staff member, Commissar Lay gradually shed his initial rudeness and coldness and became kind toward her. Commissar Lay said, Wedgia, by now you're pretty familiar with the transmission system. This is also Red Coast's offensive component, its principal part. Can you give me your views of the system as a whole? They were sitting at the lip of the steep cliff on Radar Peak, the most secluded spot on the base. The cliff seemed to drop straight off into a bottomless abyss. At first, the spot had frightened ye, but now she liked to come here by herself. You wasn't sure how to answer Commissar Lay's question. She was only responsible for maintaining and repairing equipment, and knew nothing about Red Coast as a whole, including its operation, targets, and so on. Indeed, she wasn't allowed to know. She wasn't even permitted to be present at the transmission. She pondered the question, began to speak, and stopped herself. Go ahead, speak your mind, Commissar Lay said. He ripped out a blade of grass next to him and played with it absent-mindedly. It is just a radio transmitter. That's right, just a radio transmitter. The commissar nodded, satisfied. Do you know about microwave ovens? You shook her head. They are a luxury plaything of the capitalist West. Food is heated by the energy generated from absorbing microwave radiation. At my previous research station, in order to precisely test the high temperature aging of certain components, we imported one. After work, we would use it to warm man to bread, bake a potato, that sort of thing. It's very interesting. The inside heats up first while the outside remains cold. Commissar Lay stood up and paced back and forth. He was so close to the edge of the cliff that it made ye nervous. Red Coast is a microwave oven, and its heating targets are the enemy's space vessels. If we can apply microwave radiation at a specific power level of one-tenth of a watt to one watt per square centimeter, we'll be able to disable or destroy many electronic components of satellite communications, radar, and navigation systems. Ye finally understood. Even though Red Coast was only a radio transmitter, that didn't mean it was conventional. The most surprising aspect was its transmission power, as high as 25 megawatts. This wasn't just more powerful than all communication transmissions, but also all radar transmissions. Red Coast relied on a set of gigantic capacitors. Because the power requirements were so high, the transmission circuits were also different from conventional designs. You now understood the purpose of such ultra-high power in the system, but something seemed wrong right away. The emission from the system seems to be modulated. That's right. However, the modulation is unlike that used in conventional radio communications. The purpose isn't to add information, but to use shifting frequencies and amplitudes to penetrate possible shielding by the enemy. Of course, those are still experimental. Yi nodded. Many of her questions had now been answered. Recently, two target satellites were launched from Jiuquan. The test attacks by Red Coast were completely successful. Temperature inside the satellites reached nearly a thousand degrees, and all instruments and photographic equipment on board were destroyed. In future wars, Red Coast can effectively strike at the enemy's communication and reconnaissance satellites, like the KH-8 spy satellites on which the American imperialists rely, as well as the KH-9, which are about to be launched. The lower-orbit spy satellites of the Soviet revisionists are even more vulnerable. If necessary, we even have the capacity to destroy the Salyut Space Station of the Soviet revisionists and the Skylab Station that American imperialists plan on launching next year. Commissar, what are you telling her? Someone spoke behind ye. 
She turned and saw that it was Yang Weining, who stared at Kamasarle severely. This is for work, Kamasarle said, and then left. Yang glanced at Yu without saying anything and followed Lei. Yu was left all by herself. He's the one who brought me here, but he still doesn't trust me, a disconsolate Yu thought. She was worried about Commissar Lei. At the base, Lei had more authority than Yang, since the Commissar had the final vote on most important matters, but the way he rushed away with Yang seemed to indicate that he felt the chief engineer had caught him doing something wrong. This convinced Yi that Lei had made a personal decision to tell her about the true purpose of the Red Coast project. What will happen to him as a result of this decision? As she gazed at Commissar Lei's burly back, Yi felt a wave of gratitude. For her, trust was a luxury that she dared not wish for. Compared to Yang, Lei was closer to her image of a real military officer, possessing a soldier's frank and forthright manners. Yang, on the other hand, was nothing more than a typical intellectual of the period, cautious, timid, seeking only to protect himself. Even though Yi understood him, the wide gulf already between them grew wider. The next day, Yi was transferred out of the transmission department and assigned to the monitoring department. At first, she thought this was related to the events of the day before, an attempt to move her away from the core of Red Coast. But after arriving at the monitoring department, she realized that this was more like the heart of Red Coast. Even though the two departments shared some resources, such as the antenna, the technology level of the monitoring department was far more advanced. The monitoring department had a very sophisticated and sensitive radio receiver. A ruby-based traveling wave maser amplified the signals received by the gigantic antenna, and in order to minimize interference, the core of the reception system was immersed in liquid helium at minus 269 degrees Celsius periodically. A helicopter came to replenish the supply of liquid. Helium. The reception system was thus capable of picking up very faint signals. You couldn't help but imagine how wonderful it would be to use the equipment for radio astronomy research. The monitoring department's computer system was also much bigger and more complex than the one at the transmission department. The first time she entered the main computer room, he saw a row of cathode ray tube displays. She was stunned to see programming code scrolling across each of them, and the operators were free to edit and test the code using the keyboard. When she learned programming in college, the source code was always written on the grids of special programming paper then transferred to paper tape using a typewriter. She had heard of input using a keyboard and screen, but this was the first time she had seen it. The software available astonished her even more. She learned about something called Fortran, which allowed you to program using a language close to natural language. You could even type mathematical equations directly into the code. Programming in it was several times more efficient than programming in machine code. And then there was something called a database, which allowed for easy storage and manipulation of vast amounts of data. Two days later, Commissar Lei sought Yi out for another talk. This time, they were in the main computer room of the monitoring department, in front of the row of green glowing screens. Yan Waining sat close by, not part of their conversation, but also not willing to leave which made Yi very uncomfortable. Wenjie, Commissar Lei began. Let me explain the work of the monitoring department to you. Simply put, the goal is to keep an eye on enemy activities in space, including intercepting communications between enemy space vessels in the ground and between the space vessels themselves, collaborating with our telemetry, tracking, and command centers to determine the orbits of enemy space vessels and provide data for Red Coast's combat systems. In other words, the eyes of Red Coast are here. Yang interrupted. Commissar Lei, I don't think what you're doing is a good idea. There's no need to tell her these things. Yi glanced at Yang and anxiously said, Commissar, if it's not appropriate for me to know, then... No, no, Wenjie. The commissar held up a hand to stop you from speaking. He turned to Yang. Chief Yang, I'm going to tell you the same thing I did before. 
This is for work. For when she had to perform her duties better, she must be told the purpose of her work. Yang stood up. I will report this to our superiors. That is your right, of course. But do not fret, Chief Yang. I will assume responsibility for all consequences. Yang got up and left with a bitter expression. Don't mind him. That's just the way Chief Yang is. Commissar Lei chuckled and shook his head. Then he stared at Yi and his tone became solemn. Wenjie, when we first brought you to the base, the goal was simple. Red Coast's monitoring systems often had interference caused by electromagnetic radiation from solar flares and sunspots. Fortuitously, we saw your paper and realized that you had researched solar activity. Among Chinese scholars, your predictive model turned out to be the most accurate so we wanted to ask for your help in solving this problem. But after you came, you showed very strong abilities, so we decided to give you more responsibilities. My thought was this, assign you first to the transmission department, then the monitoring department. This way, you'd gain a comprehensive understanding of Red Coast as a whole and we could wait and see where to assign you after that. Of course, as you can see, this plan has met with some resistance. But I have trust in you, Wenjie. Let me be clear, until now, the trust placed in you has been mine, personally. I hope that you can continue to work hard and earn the trust of the organization as a whole. Commissar Lei placed a hand on Ye's shoulder. She felt the warmth and strength conveyed through it. Wenjie, let me tell you my sincere hope, one day, I'd like to call you Comrade Yi. Lei stood up and strode away in the confident manner of a soldier. Ye's eyes were filled with tears. Seen through them, the code on the screen became flickering flames. This was the first time she had cried since the death of her father. As Ye familiarized herself with the work of the monitoring department, she discovered that she was far less successful here than at the transmission department. The computer science knowledge she had was outdated and she had to learn the software techniques from scratch. Even though. Commissar Lei trusted her, the restrictions on her were severe. She was allowed to view the software source code, for example, but was forbidden from touching the database. On a day-to-day -day basis, he was mainly supervised by Yang. He became even ruder to her, and would get angry at her for the smallest things. Commissar Lei talked to him about it multiple times without effect. It seemed that Yang became filled with a nameless anxiety as soon as he saw Yi. Gradually, as Yi encountered more and more unexplainable matters in her work, she came to realize that the Red Coast project was far more complex than she had imagined. One day, the monitoring system intercepted a transmission that, after being deciphered by the computer, turned out to be a few satellite photographs. The blurry images were sent to the General Staff Department's Surveying and Mapping Bureau for interpretation. They turned out to be images of important military targets in China, including the Naval Harbor at Qingdao and several key factories of the Third Front Program. Analysis confirmed that these images came from the KH-9 American Reconnaissance System. The first KH-9 satellite had just been launched. Although it mainly relied on recoverable film capsules for intelligence gathering, it was also being used to test out the more advanced technique of radio transmission of digital images. Due to the technology's immaturity, the satellite transmitted at a low frequency, which increased its range of reception sufficiently for it to be intercepted by Red Coast. And because it was only a test, the encryption was not very secure and could be broken. The KH-9 was without a doubt an important monitoring target, as it presented a rare opportunity to gather more information about American satellite reconnaissance systems. Yet, after the third day, Yan Waning ordered a change in the frequency and direction of monitoring and abandoned the target. Yi found the decision incomprehensible. Another event also shocked her. Even though she was now in the monitoring department, Sometimes the transmission department still needed her. One time, she accidentally saw the frequency settings for a few upcoming transmissions. She discovered that the designated frequencies for 
transmissions 304, 318, and 325 were lower than microwave range and could not result in any heating effect in the target. One day, an officer summoned Yi to the main base administrative office out of the blue. From the officer's tone and expression, Yi knew that something had gone wrong. As she walked into the office, the scene before her seemed familiar. All the senior officers of the base were present, along with two officers she didn't know. However, she could tell at a glance that they were from higher up in the chain of command. Everyone's icy stares focused on her, but the sensitivity she had developed over the stormy years informed her that she wasn't the one in big trouble today. She was at most a sideshow. She saw Commissar Lay sitting in a corner with a dejected look. He's finally going to pay for trusting me, she thought. At once, she decided that she would do whatever she could to save him. She would take responsibility for everything, even lie if necessary. But Commissar Lay was the first to speak, and what he said was completely unexpected. You and Jia. I must make it clear at the start that I do not agree with what is about to be done. The decision was made by Chief Engineer Yang after requesting instructions from our superiors. He alone will be responsible for all consequences. Commissar Lei turned to look at Yang, who nodded solemnly. Lei continued, In order to better utilize your skills at Red Coast Base, Chief Engineer Yang repeatedly requested permission from our superiors to abandon the cover story we've been using with you. Our comrades from the Army Political Department, he indicated the two officers you didn't know, were sent to investigate your work situation. Finally, with the approval of our superiors, we've decided to inform you of the true nature of the Red Coast Project. Only after a long pause did he finally understand Commissar Lei's meaning. He had been lying to her all along. I hope you will treasure this opportunity and work hard to redeem your sins. After this, you must behave with the utmost propriety. Any reactionary behavior will be severely punished. Commissar Lei stared at Yi. He was a completely different person from the image Yi had formed of him. Are we clear? Good. Now Chief Yang can explain. The others left leaving only Yang and Yi. If you don't want this, there's still time. Yi discerned the weight behind these words. She now understood Yang's anxiety whenever he had seen her the last few weeks. To make full use of her skills, it was necessary for her to know the truth about Red Coast. However, this choice would extinguish the last ray of hope she had of ever leaving Radar Peak. Once she said yes, she really would spend the rest of her life at Red Coast Base. I agree, he said softly, but resolutely. Thus, on this early summer evening, as the wind howled through the giant parabolic antenna, and as the forest rustled over the greater Shingan Mountains in the distance, Yan Waining explained to Yi Wenjie the true nature of Red Coast. It was a fairy tale for the ages, even more incredible than the Commissar's lies. 13. Red Coast 3. Selected Documents from the Red Coast Project. These documents were declassified three years after Yu Wenjie told Wang Miao the inside story of Red Coast and provide background information for what she told him. I. A question largely ignored by trends in fundamental world scientific research based on modern and contemporary history. There are two ways in which the results of fundamental scientific research can be converted into practical applications, gradualistic mode and saltatory mode. Gradualistic mode, theoretical, fundamental results are gradually applied to technology. Advances accumulate until they reach a breakthrough. Recent examples include the development of space technology. Saltatory mode, theoretical, fundamental results rapidly become applied technology leading to a technological leap. Recent examples include the appearance of atomic weapons. Until the 40s, some of the foremost physicists still thought it would never be possible to release the energy of the atom. But atomic weapons then appeared. Within a very short period, we define a technology leap to occur when fundamental science is converted to applied technology across a great span in an extremely brief time interval. 
Currently, both NATO and the Warsaw Pact are intensely active in fundamental research and investing heavily in it. One or more technological leaps can occur at any time. Such an occurrence will pose a major threat to our strategic planning. This article argues that our focus is currently on the gradualistic mode of technology development, and insufficient attention is paid to the possibility of technology leaps. Starting from a higher vantage point, we should develop a comprehensive strategy and set of principles so that we can respond appropriately when technological leaps occur. Fields where technological leaps are most likely physics, biology, computer science, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Of all fields, this is the one in which the possibility for a technology leap is greatest. If a leap occurs in this field, the impact will exceed the sum of technology leaps in the other three fields. Distribute this article to appropriate personnel and organize discussion groups. The article's views will not be to the liking of some, but let's not rush to label the author. The key is to appreciate the author's long-term thinking. Some comrades cannot see beyond the ends of their noses, possibly because of the greater political environment, possibly because of their arrogance. This is not good. Strategic blind spots are extremely dangerous. In my view, of the four fields where technology leaps may occur, we have given the least thought to the last one. It's worth some attention, and we should systematically analyze the matter in depth. Signed, Triple X Date, XX slash XX slash 196X. 2. Research Report on the Possibility of Technology Leap Due to the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence 1. Current international research trends the United States and other NATO states. The scientific case and the necessity for SETI are generally accepted. And strong academic support exists. Project Ozma. In 1960, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia, searched for extraterrestrial intelligence with a radio telescope 26 meters in diameter. The project examined the stars Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani for 200 hours using ranges near the 1.420 GHz frequency. Project Ozma 2, which will involve more targets and a broader frequency range, is planned for 1972. Probes. The Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 probes, each of which will carry a metal plaque containing information about civilization on Earth, are scheduled for launch in 1972. The Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes, each of which will carry a metal audio record, are scheduled for launch in 1977. The Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, constructed in 1963, this is an important instrument for SETI. Its effective energy collection area is about 20 acres, which is greater than the sum of the collecting areas of all other radio telescopes in the world. When combined with its computer system, it can simultaneously monitor 65,000 channels and is also capable of ultra-high energy transmissions. The Soviet Union. Few sources of intelligence are available, but there are indications that large investments have been made in the field. Compared to NATO countries, the research seems to be more systematic and long-term. Based on certain isolated information channels, Plans are currently underway to build a global-scale Very Long Baseline Interferometry Aperture Synthesis Radio Telescope System. Once the system is completed, it will possess the world's most powerful deep space exploration capabilities. 2. Preliminary Analysis of Social Patterns of Extraterrestrial Civilizations Using a Materialist Conception of History 3. Preliminary analysis of the influence of extraterrestrial civilizations on human social and political trends for Preliminary analysis of the influence on current international patterns due to possible contact with extraterrestrial civilizations unidirectional contact Bidirectional contact 5. The danger and consequences of superpowers making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact analysis of consequences of American imperialists, and NATO making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact. Analysis of consequences of Soviet revisionists 
and Warsaw Pact making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact. Others have already sent their messages out into space. It's dangerous if extraterrestrials only hear their voices. We should speak up as well. Only then will they get a complete picture of human society. It's not possible to get the truth by only listening to one side. We must make this happen, and quickly. Signed, Triple X Date, XX slash XX slash 196X. 3. Research report on the initial phase of the Red Coast Project Top Secret Number of Copies. 2. Summary document, Central Document Number XXXXXX, forwarded to the Commission for Science, Technology, and Industry for National Defense, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and the Central Planning Commission, Department of National Defense, disseminated at the XXXXXX Conference and the XXXXXX Conference, partially disseminated at the XXXXXX Conference. Topic Serial Number 3760 Code Name Red Coast 1 Goal to search for the possible existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and to attempt contact and exchange. 2. Theoretical study of the Red Coast Project Searching and Monitoring Monitoring Frequency Range 1000 MHz to 40,000 MHz Monitoring Channels 15,000 Key Frequencies to Monitor Hydrogen Atom Frequency at 1420 MHz Hydroxyl Radical Radiation Frequency at 1 667 MHz Water Molecule Radiation Frequency at 22,000 MHz Monitoring Target Range a sphere centered around Earth with a radius of 1,000 light-years, containing approximately 20 million stars. For a list of targets, please see Appendix 1. Message Transmission Transmission Frequencies 2,800 MHz, 12,000 MHz, 22,000 MHz Transmission Power 10 to 25 MW Transmission Targets A sphere centered around Earth with a radius of 200 light-years, containing approximately 100,000 stars. For a list of targets, please see Appendix 2. Development of the Red Coast Self-Interpreting Code System Guiding Principle Using universal, basic mathematical and physical laws, construct an elemental linguistic code that can be understood by any civilization that has mastered basic algebra. Euclidean Geometry and the Laws of Classical Mechanics Using the elemental code above and supplemented with low-resolution images, gradually build up to a full linguistic system. Languages supported, Chinese and Esperanto. The entire system's information content should be 680 kilobytes transmission times at the 2,800 MHz, 12,000 MHz, and 22,000 MHz channels are 1,183 minutes, 224 minutes, and 132 minutes respectively. 3. Implementation Plan for the Red Coast Project Preliminary Design for the Red Coast Monitoring and Searching System Preliminary Design for the Red Coast Transmission System Preliminary Site Selection Plan for Red Coast Base. Preliminary Thoughts on the Formation of Red Coast Force from Within the 2nd Artillery Corps 4. Content of Message Transmitted by Red Coast Overview of Earth. Overview of Life on Earth, Overview of Human Society, Basic World History. Total Information Content, 17.5 kilobytes. The entire message will be sent after transmitting the self-interpreting code system. Transmission times of message at the 2,800 MHz, 12,000 MHz, and 22,000 MHz channels are 31 minutes, 7.5 minutes, and 3.5 minutes, respectively. The message will be carefully vetted by a multidisciplinary review to ensure that it will not give away the Earth's coordinates relative to the Milky Way. Among the three channels, transmission at the higher frequency 12,000 MHz and 22,000 MHz channels should be minimized to reduce the likelihood that the source of transmission may be precisely ascertained. 4. Message to Extraterrestrial Civilization's First Draft Attention you who have received this message. This message was sent out by a country that represents revolutionary justice on Earth. 
Before this, you may have already received other messages sent from the same direction. Those messages were sent by an imperialist superpower on this planet. That superpower is struggling against another superpower for world domination so that it can drag human history backwards. We hope you will not listen to their lies. Stand with justice. Stand with the revolution. This is utter crap. It's enough to put up big character posters everywhere on the ground, but we should not send them into space. The Cultural Revolution leadership should no longer have any involvement with Red Coast. Such an important message must be composed carefully. It's probably best to have it drafted by a special committee and then discussed and approved by a meeting of the Politburo. Signed, Triple X Date XX slash XX slash 196 X second draft third draft fourth draft we extend our best wishes to you, inhabitants of another world. After reading the following message, you should have a basic understanding of civilization on earth. By dint of long toil and creativity, the human race has built a splendid civilization, blossoming with a multitude of diverse cultures. We have also begun to understand the laws governing the natural world and the development of human societies. We cherish all that we have accomplished. But our world is still flawed. Hate exists, as does prejudice and war. Because of conflicts between the forces of production and the relations of production, wealth distribution is extremely uneven, and large portions of humanity live in poverty and misery. Human societies are working hard to resolve the difficulties and problems they face, striving to create a better future for Earth's civilization. The country that sent this message is engaged in this effort. We are dedicated to building an ideal society, where the labor and value of every member of the human race are fully respected, where everyone's material and spiritual needs are fully met, so that civilization on Earth may become more perfect. With the best of intentions, we look forward to establishing contact with other civilized societies in the universe. We look forward to working together with you to build a better life in this vast universe. V. Related Policies and Strategies 1. Consideration of Policies and Strategies After Reception of Message from Extraterrestrial Intelligence 2. Consideration of Policies and Strategies After Establishing Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Instructions from Central Leadership, it's important to take the time out of our busy schedules to do something entirely unrelated to our immediate needs. This project has allowed us to give some thought to issues we have never had time for. Indeed, we can think through them only when we take a sufficiently high vantage point. This alone is enough to justify the Red Coast project. How wonderful it will be if the universe really contains other intelligences and other societies. Bystanders have the clearest view. Someone truly neutral will then be able to comment on whether we're the heroes or villains of history. Signed, Triple X Date, XX slash XX slash 196X.